Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Guilford, House of Faith, where we believe in preaching, teaching, reaching, and healing. Our director of music has come up with a song that says we are gathered to worship him, to lift up our voices in praise. We're glad you have joined us in celebration to God Almighty, wonderful Savior, Lord of Lord, to him who is the King of Kings. We welcome you to First Baptist Church. Thank you for coming today. God be praised. This service is a service designed so that we can worship the Lord to get the word and go out to serve. Thank you for joining us today. Come on back and see us anytime. But right now, let's get ready to go into worship. this morning. You're just grateful to the Lord for one more day. Come on and clap your hands. Come on and give the Lord praise. Come on and give the Lord glory. Come on if you recognize that it could have been, would have been, should have been the other way. But God woke you up this morning. I said he started you on your way. I said he put running in your feet and blood in your veins. Come on, look at somebody and say, you got a reason, you got a right. You even have a responsibility to give him glory. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made and we've come to rejoice and be glad in it. Would you meet me in the place and the posture of prayer? Father, we thank you this morning. We don't take for granted your blessing. God, we don't take for granted your goodness. But goodness and mercy has been following us, us all the days of our lives. And so, God, we just want to say thank you. God, we didn't even come to ask you for anything. But we've come to thank you for everything. You've been a mighty good God. You've been better to us beyond our deserving and certainly beyond our expectation. So for that, we want to say thank you. And God, thank you for allowing us to see a brand new day. Some of us buried some folk this year, God, and we learned not to take life for granted. So thank you for being a life giver. Thank you for being the lifter upper of our head. Now, God, we thank you for the occasion of life givers in the celebration of women. God, we thank you that you've gathered us in this place. This is holy ground. And God, we look to meet your presence here. And God, we look to meet the Holy Spirit here. Bread from heaven, feed us until we want no more. God, open our ears and our hearts and our minds so that we can just see Jesus. We saw the text message on the way to church and we saw the email, God, and we saw the look on a loved one's face, but God, we put all of that aside because we just want to see Jesus. So show us your face. Show us your glory. Show us your power. Move from heart to heart and breast to breast. Hide me behind this sacred desk and cover me under the drippings of your blood, oh God. Get the glory for yourself. And when we leave this place, we won't steal your glory, but we'll be careful to say that Jesus did it. It is in that marvelous and that matchless and that majestic name. Would you do me a favor if you love the Lord because he heard your cry and he pitied every groan and as long as you live, you made a decision if troubles rise, you're going to hasten. Come on and clap your hands like you love the Lord this morning. I said God's been better to you than that. Don't you pity pat the Lord this morning, but 
Come on, open yourself, loose yourself, and press you get in the presence of a living God. God is worthy of the praise and the glory. Come on and give him what he's due. Come on, I know you're ready for me to preach, but he's ready for you to praise. And in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And in his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God is worthy. While you're thanking God for Jesus, help me thank God for your pastor. Amen. Make a whole lot of noise for the Reverend Dr. Tyrone P. Jones IV. Amen. Your pastor and my friend, you could do a little bit better than that for the one that has watch and care over your very soul. Amen. The Bible says we ought to give honor to whom honor is due. And we celebrate the man of God this morning. And certainly we celebrate his queen. Amen. Thank God for Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Sapp Jones. Amen. Love you, sis. And we certainly thank God for who you are in the kingdom. Amen. You do know that God indicates how much he loves you by who God sends to lead you. And we thank God for their leadership. Amen. Just come on. Thank God for them one more time. Make them feel real good and love. Here's what I always say. I always say never get tired of clapping for people. Because your time is coming, and you're going to want somebody to clap for you. So come on, help us thank God one more time. Can we celebrate, amen, all of the women in the house? Sisters, it is Women's Day, amen. Y'all ought to make some noise for yourselves this morning. Come on, ladies, make some noise for you. I say never get tired of celebrating you, amen. Look at three sisters and say, girl, you look good. You look wonderful. Is that a new hat? Is that a new wig? A new weave? Amen. You done lost some weight. You look wonderful. The glory of God looks good on you this morning. And certainly we celebrate the ministry of womanhood. Help me thank God, amen, for this choir, this singing aggregation who has led us in to worship. Amen. Even your liturgical dances as you're grabbing your Bible. Amen. We thank God for them. Amen. And we thank God for your press this morning. How many know that uh, a lot of times we, we, we see a little rain outside and woo, we roll over. Amen. The Lord knows my heart. But look at you in the sanctuary. Amen. That's because the Lord has a word for you and we celebrate our virtual viewers this morning as well. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew gospel according to St. Matthew the 14th chapter my uh, voice is unusually thin this morning um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna need some help from y'all y'all gonna help me this morning amen it's it's thin it was starting to go at the first service but Matthew 14 verse 22 verse 22 we're going to journey together to verse 33. But in the New King James Version, my Bible reads this way. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Thus ends the reading of God's word before taking your seat. Look at your neighbor to your left or right and or smile. Smile. We, come on, y'all. We in church. We, you, and you freely chose that seat. So, so go on and smile at them and say, neighbor, oh, my dear neighbor, burn the boats. Amen. You may be seated. Burn. Burn the boat. Burn it down. Burn. Legend has it that in the year 1519, a man by the name of Hernan Cortez gathered several hundred soldiers and sailors and set out for a daring voyage to a place called Veracruz. Their mission was to go and to capture a great treasure that many others had attempted to capture before but failed. Historians say that as they set sail, some of the soldiers began to bemoan the peril of their mission. So much so that once they arrived upon the shore of Veracruz, Cortez gave a very inspiring speech that outlined a very strange strategy. After disembarking from the boats that brought them from their home to the shores, Cortez turned to his soldiers and commanded them to burn the boats. Understand, if you will, the essence of this audacious directive. Because Cortez gave the order to burn the boats, because he understood that men who fight with an exit plan don't fight the same as men without one. And by eliminating their only exit strategy, by removing their plan B, if you will, they would have no ability to retreat and therefore would be forced to go forward to conquer new territory. I want to sagaciously suggest this morning that perhaps the reason that some of us are not flourishing in faith and thriving in the things of God is because perhaps you've yet to burn your boats. How sad and sobering it is that so many Christians will never reach the height and depth of God's divine intention for their lives because they've become accustomed to craving comfort. Some of us would rather live in mediocrity than to tolerate the tension that goes with training your faith to trust God and to believe that God has a destiny in mind for you that is deeper than your current reality. Could it be that some of us are not flourishing because we're still floating on excuses that limit us to living beneath God's desire and design for your life? Burning the boats then is an audacious statement of faith that declares that for me, I'm all in. That, that for me, there is no plan B. There, there is no escape route. There, there are no workarounds. I'm not backing up. I'm not backing down. I, I'm not turning around because I am fully committed and fully vested to going forward in faith. And I have a sneaky suspicion that there are people under the sound of my voice who are wrestling with restlessness in your spirit because you sense a call from God to go beyond the realm and the range and the reach of normality and to move into a more expansive experience. Burning your boat then is a commitment to going outside of your comfort zone and into unfamiliar and unchartered territory. Because the truth of the matter is that some of us have an unhealthy relationship with safety. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to make an announcement this morning that your new life is going to cost you your old one. And too many times we stay safe and stuck instead of taking a righteous risk in God. And as a consequence, we end up living limited and little lives, never leaving, never launching, never learning, and never leaning into the great and glorious, miraculous opportunities that are awaiting us right there on the water. In fact, somebody can testify by the Spirit that what I'm saying is not only just good information, but it's also a God confirmation because all year you felt the providential provoking of God urging you to come and to do what it is that you've never done and to go where it is that you've never been. And while it is you were born looking like your parents, understand you're going to die looking like your decisions. But my simple and significant assignment this morning is simply to awaken the water walker in you. I've come to stir, even startle your faith into leaving the cramped little quarters of your comfort zone and to lead a life of ordinary existence and leap into the extraordinary call that God has for you to do the unthinkable, the unprecedented, the unexpected, and the unimaginable. Somebody say, burn the boats. For many of us who are familiar with scripture or know anything about the pertinent personalities in the Bible, you will agree with me that of all the disciples, most of us can readily relate to Peter. Peter stands out as our favorite disciple because we can identify with Peter, can't we? P Peter, y'all, is a lot like us. P Peter is a walking paradox, a walking contradiction. He has a spiritual side where at times he has great revelation that's too deep for human understanding. But now understand he also has a human side where he acts like he doesn't even know who Jesus is. P Peter y'all is never scared of being loud and wrong. He's impetuous, he's impatient, and he's in impulsive. Peter is a lot like us. In one moment he'll bless you but if you catch him on the wrong day he will cut and cuss you. Peter is a lot like us. But despite the complexities of his personality, I celebrate Peter this morning because he often holds a different perspective from the other disciples. Just look at the text because while everybody was moved by fear, Peter is the only disciple that is moved by faith. What, what then are the convictions of faith that one must have if in fact you are going to burn your boats? I'm glad you asked because the Bible says that after feeding the 5,000, Jesus went up to a mountaintop to pray alone and he made, let the church say made, he, he made his disciples go to the other side. I, I said he made them, pastor, go to the other side without him he compelled them but he did not companion them but Jesus sent them to the other side the text says he did not go with them physically because he was trying to train them how to trust him even when they can't see him and as it is they are in the boat rowing trying to get to the other side what they discover is that they run into a storm the bible says that they are in the middle of the sea struggling and straining to get to the the other side. Why? Because the wind is contrary. Here it is that the disciples are on mission serving the purposes of God in their life and right there in the midst of fulfilling their God-given assignment, they were confronted with unexpected adversity. I came to tell you that if in fact you're going to burn the boats, the first thing you have to do is learn how to add 
advance in adverse environments. Because did you know that that's how life happens? One moment you're just going along, floating along just fine, and the very next moment you can just be caught up in a storm. D did you know that you could be feeling fine just one morning and all of a sudden go to the doctor and there you are in the midst of a medical storm? That That's what happened to the disciples. They did not anticipate that they would encounter adversity on their God-given assignment. They were doing what they were called to do when out of nowhere they had to navigate a nautical nuisance in the form of a storm. Here it is. They're obeying Jesus' divine directive going and rowing in the right direction and run smack into a distraction. And I need you to understand church that just because you have a relationship with with the Lord Jesus Christ just because you're fire baptized born again understand that doesn't mean that you will not have to encounter a difficulty and a storm in you I know you come to church every Sunday you usher on the door you sing in the choir you serve sacrificially but that does not mean that storms will not still form in your life life. Do you understand that you can be in complete compliance with the voice, the will, and the way of God, and a storm can still form in your life? Your status as a disciple does not absolve you from having to deal with adversity, nor prevent you from having painful predicaments, nor does it disqualify you from having to deal with disappointments. And I don't mean to burst your theological bubble this morning, but I want to disabuse somebody from that romanticized, glamorized, idealized understanding of calling because when you read your Bible from Genesis to Maps, what you will discover is that anybody that ever said yes to the Lord had to advance through adversity. I said whenever it is that God called Abraham to leave earth or Gideon to lead an army or Esther to defy the king Mary to give birth to the Messiah the call always came couched in a conflict and Peter and the disciples are no different for the text says that the winds and the waves were actively working against them in other words church every time they took one step forward there was something that was pushing them five steps back Every time they gained a little bit of momentum, there was something that was pushing up against their forward progression. And I came to tell somebody that if you ever hope to advance in faith and follow God's divine directive to go into uncharted territory, then you're going to have to learn how to prepare for the pushback. What, what, what are you saying, Reverend? I'm saying that you're going to have to grow your spiritual muscles and grow your capacity to expect the attack. Because whenever it is you're on divine assignment from God, whenever you're flowing in anything significant or substantial to advance God's kingdom agenda in the earth, there will always be stuff that rises up to distract you, to discourage you, to disrupt the trajectory of the journey that you are on to get to the other side. Just look at how the text testifies to the timeliness of the attack because it is not a cosmic coincidence that it wasn't until Jesus told them to go to the other side that all of a sudden things started to get contrary because whenever you get a vision from God that takes you from your noun to your next you should expect to have to deal with spiritual warfare in fact I've discovered that it's usually right about the time that you're about to make a major transition 
in life. And I want to make sure I'm in the right place, preaching to the right people. Anybody got a vision for your life to go from where you are right now to go to the another place in Christ? Because whenever you get that vision to go to the, nether, to the other side, that's generally when all kinds of stuff begins to break loose in your life. Just wink or wave at me in the spirit. If you know preacher, I know exactly what you're talking about because the enemy only fights folk that are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus made them go to the other side knowing that they were going to be met with a storm because he's trying to teach them, hear me this morning, Guilford, that there is no spiritual elevation without demonic aggravation. So if you don't want to deal with the aggravation of people getting on your nerves and people talking about you and people lying on you and people spreading false rumors and criticizing you and scandalizing your name and posting craziness on social media. If you don't want to deal with people talking about your body image and questioning your motives and attacking your character and assailing your integrity, then baby, you stay right there in the boat. But I'm looking for about 38 water walkers in here this morning that understand that anytime you're doing anything bold and brave in the name of Jesus, then you ought to expect the attack. In fact, can I give you this leadership hack for the attack? You ought to learn not to concern yourself when things are contrary or chaotic, but the time for you to get concerned is when stuff gets quiet. Because when things are calm and quiet, that means that the enemy don't even see you as a threat. But I've lived through a storm or two in my own black life. And I understand that the advantage is always in the adversity. And you don't need to get discouraged when you're attacked. Because how many know that the attack is just an indication from God for you to push on? It's just a confirmation. I said that the push back is a confirmation from God baby for you to push on will you look at your neighbor and say God says push on because I don't know what kind of storm you're in this morning but I came to awaken the water walker in you to tell somebody you've got to learn how to advance in the midst of advert tell somebody advance anyhow I know they looking at you crazy advance anyhow I know they turn down your loan advance anyhow I know they won't give you the promotion advance any because every adversity is a divine opportunity to magnify God's sovereignty and the same God that called you to it will grace you through it Bur burning the boats means learning how to advance in adverse environments. Here it is. It, all, it also means not getting disoriented in the darkness. Don't let the darkness disorient your vision. The Bible says they are in what, y'all? The fourth watch. And the disciples are afraid. I want to be very intentional here because I want to redeem, Pastor, our view of the darkness. Because so often we read scripture with a preference or predilection for the light. But how many know as people of African descent, whose skin has been kissed by the sun, you, you don't ever want to read scripture in a way that privileges the light over the dark. But, but, but I want to expand the aperture of the lens through which we read scripture so that you don't read it with this binary notion that light always equals good and dark always equals bad. Preach for me. You, you ought to read it recognizing that there is beauty in the darkness. Every time I look in the mirror, 
I see a witness looking back at me and you saw it this morning in the mirror too letting you know every time I look at this mahogany skin and this broad nose and these pink lips and these round hips there's a witness I ain't scared I, I said there are those that are trying to buy what you were born with it's called cultural appropriation. I, I said there are folks getting injections and implants. And here it is, you just woke up. Tell somebody, I, I just woke up like this. I, I just woke up and my God, I saw the glory and it was marvelous in our eyes because there is beauty. Yeah, in the dark. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And here it is. Darkness filled the face of the deep. Then God created the light. In other words, God initiated the entire creative order from the world of darkness. Which means the very existence of light is dependent on the darkness tell somebody we were here first I, I'm just I'm just trying to get somebody in this place to understand that there is beauty in the darkness don't despise the darkness don't let the darkness disorient your vision did you not know that seeds are buried in a dark ground and they develop where in the dark that our very lives came to be in the darkness of our mother's womb that the gifting of darkness allows you and I to have sweet sleep at night that we can't get the rest that our bodies need unless we lay down in the darkness that we cannot behold the beauty of the spectacle of the stars in the galaxy unless we view them against the backdrop preach for me of a very black sky the psalmist said it this way where can I go from your spirit because if I make my bed in a dark hell thou art there I just came to tell you don't despise the darkness because linguistically darkness is a scary thing but narratively darkness is a sacred thing and this is why you've got to fix, focus, and fasten your faith on a vision of God and not get disoriented during a dark season because fear will always fight against your sight. Fear will always block your ability to receive a fresh revelation from God. And the Bible says that the darker the night grew, the storm grew stronger and their faith grew weaker. Here it is because Jesus had not yet come. And every once in a while, the Lord will allow you and I to go through some can't see seasons. Can't, can't see how you're going to survive this divorce. Can't, can't see how you're going to survive the betrayal of that friendship and that trust. Can't see how you're going to survive that diagnosis. Can't see how you're going to come through. But I came to tell you, don't you let the darkness disorient your vision. Because just because you don't see the Lord moving, that doesn't mean that God ain't doing anything. They are waiting in the water, on the, in, a, in a storm on the water for him, trying to pursue their vision in the darkness. And the Bible says that they are afraid. It was Joan Chitterster, one of my favorite authors, that prolific Catholic nun that said that the light we gain in darkness is the awareness that however bleak <laughs> the place of darkness was for us we did not die there and that's a real good place for somebody to shout this morning because I came to make a pronouncement over your life and serve notice to the enemy that you shall live and you will not die somebody has been dealing with a contrary wind for so long but you ought to put your hand on your heart and prophesy to yourself this morning and say I'm gonna survive 
by this storm that it won't always be like this but the Lord will perfect that concerning me and sooner or later it's going to turn in my favor is there anybody in here that knows it's turning around for me you, you, you going to survive it? Uh, Pastor, how do you know I'm going to survive it? It's in the Bible because the Bible says that they are in the fourth watch. <laughs> how many understand that the darkest watch of the night is actually the third watch, which is between 12 midnight and 3 a.m.? But the book says, says that they are in the fourth watch, which is, which is actually between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So the reason I can tell you that you're going to survive the storm is because you have already survived the worst part. Would you touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, the storm is passing over. And I just stopped by to tell somebody that the devil should have killed me on last night. But God sent me to here to tell you he messed around and allowed you to see the sun come up. And last night was the last night that you gonna cry like this, that you gonna worry like this, that you gonna walk the floor. Is there anybody in here that know that Jesus will bring you through because a weeping may endure for a night? Hey, I feel like preaching, but joy, tell somebody Jesus' joy comes in the morning. Don't get disoriented in the dark. Burning the boats means learning how to advance in adverse environments. I'm done. It means not getting disoriented. But here's why you've got to burn your boat. <laughs> Uh, sisters, you got to burn your boat. I'm ready. <laughs> you got to burn your boat because you are not built for the boat. Tell somebody I'm just built different. The, the, the Bible says, Peter, Peter says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. Come here, Guilford. Isn't it interesting that you can have 12 people in the same situation hey, fighting the same problem but only one person is able to recognize Jesus in the midst everybody thought Jesus was a ghost out of all 12 Peter is the only one that said no I think that's Jesus that's why you shouldn't get upset when people don't see what you see in the spirit. Come here. Don't, don't, don't you get mad when your prayer partner can't see what you see in the spirit. Because they're looking through the lens of fear. But you're looking through the lens of faith. So what they call a scary obstacle, you call a sacred opportunity. In other words, Peter was willing to burn the boat because Peter wasn't built for the boat. And I want to talk to some folks in here who understand I'm just built different. You're not cocky. You're not arrogant. You're not saying you're better than anybody. You're just saying you build different. My mindset is different. My vision is different. My praise is different. I raise my children different. My worldview is different. My hallelujah is different. My prayer life is different. My study habits are different. My witness is different. Somebody in here you ought to give God praise if you know I'm not saying I'm better I'm just saying I'm built different no shade no heat no judgment on you I'm just saying I can't stay here because I wasn't built that way see we love to shout y'all about what it is that Peter walked towards and we love to shout about what Peter walked on but we never celebrate what Peter walked away from because in order to walk on the water he had to be willing to step out and to step over some other people and separate himself from the crowd I read
spread somewhere and I'm in my seat, that fish will only grow to the size of the tank they're in. In other words, their potential will never extend beyond their environment. And I don't know who I came to preach to this morning, but God says the reason you've got to get out of the boat is because your tank is too small. See, that's why some of us are no longer comfortable in some of the relationships and some of the associations we used to be in. It's not because you think you better. It's just because God says you've outgrown the season of life that you were in. And God says, I'm trying to do something new in your life. I'm trying to take you somewhere different. But you're so addicted to the opinion of people and their approval that you're willing to forsake your future because you want to get comfortable in the familiar. But the Bible, the Bible says that Peter got out of the boat because Peter was built different and he refused to confine his calling to the consensus of the crowd. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I came to tell you that God says he gave you a different spirit. You ought to stop trying to fit in. You're not supposed to fit in. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. You're not supposed to dress like everybody else. You're not supposed to preach like everybody else because your assignment is not to fit in the box, but your assignment is to break the box. Would you give three people a high five and say burn the boat and break the box? I've come to a point in my own life, yes, that at 52, I can't get worried about what people think about me, but it's time for me to decide, to disenlarge, to disembark, to separate myself. And God said the same is true for you. You can't stay in that tiny little box. That box can't contain all your gifts. That box can't contain all your anointing. That box can't contain all your vision. That box can't contain all the ideas. That box can't contain who I made you to be. Is there anybody in here that doesn't mind looking at your neighbor and say, if you want to stay here stuck on stupid, then that's you. But I, I, I got to go. I got to get out the box. Because if I stay here, my dreams going to suffocate. If I stay here, my anointing is going to erode. If I stay here, I'm going to die. But God sent me here to tell somebody, you ought to break the box. You ought to burn the boat. And you ought to jump the rope. You heard what I said. I said you ought to break the box. You ought to burn the boat. You ought to jump the rope. Any sisters in here over the age of 45, just wave at me. Y'all remember when we were little girls? Y'all remember we had three sets of clothes. We had school clothes. We had church clothes. And then we had a, a play clothes. I said we had play clothes. We had school clothes. And we had church clothes. The kids don't go outside anymore. They stuck on a PlayStation. But y'all remember we used to go out and we used to play dodgeball and we used to play tag and we used to play hopscotch well in my hood we played double dutch y'all remember double dutch when you played double dutch there was a sister right here and then there was a sister right here and it went a little something like this y'all remember and then there was a third sister who was right here, and this is how she would be. And, and these two right here, they looking at her like, girl, come on. And God sent me here to tell somebody, it's time for you to jump the rope. You can't keep playing double dutch with your destiny. But at some point, you got to decide to jump the rope and get in the game. I'm out of here today. But would you look at three people and say, burn the boat, break the box, and jump the rope. Would you find three people in the sanctuary and say girl God 
said, it's time for you to burn the box, break the rope, jump the rope, and break the box. You can't stay stuck where you are, but now is the time, and now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it is the thing that God is calling in your life. Is there anybody here that knows it's time? Tell somebody, excuse me, pardon me, I gotta go, I gotta leave, I gotta write the book now, I gotta start the business now, I gotta do a new thing now, because God says burn the boat, break the box, trump the rope, say it, say it, say it. to give him praise every woman pastor cannot pray me every sister I'm not compelling anybody if you know God is telling you it's time to do something different be someone different try something different Go someplace different. Come to the altar. Because you're going to suffocate. You're going to drown. If you don't try God. Callings can be complicated. Jesus called him out on the water. Callings can be complicated. Stop saying because you bumped up against trial that it ain't God. The fact that you're bumped up against it may be the very confirmation that it is gone. Somebody, I don't know who you are, but I feel it. I feel it in my spirit. God has been calling you to do something and you've not yet done it. The reason you haven't done it is because you are afraid of failing. The reason we don't move out on the water. Hear me, it's because we stop reading. Look at sister and say there's a verse 33. There's a verse 33. There's a verse 33. Y'all looking at me. I said look at your sister and say there's a verse 33. There's a verse 33. See, you closed your Bible too soon because there's a verse 33. And verse 33 says, you know, because we, we love to shout you on, he sunk, and Lord save me, and Jesus, and, yeah, and let's go home. But there's a verse 33. Because verse 33 says, and when they got back on the boat. My question is, who is they? Because the text doesn't say that Jesus picked up Peter and then carried him back on the boat. Tell somebody there's a verse 33. Could it be that Peter walked on the water a second time? But we're only reading about his first failure. Because people love to talk about what you did that didn't work. They give little press to what you did that did work. I'm saying God called him. He failed the first time. But the calling and the gifts of God are without repentance. And the call is perpetual. So just because he failed the first time did not eradicate the call that God had over his life.
some of you have not moved into the deep. You've not burnt your boat because you're afraid of failure. The Bible says the same people that he failed in front of were the same people that bowed down in worship when he got on the boat. Lift your hands. Somebody here, you're saying, but what if, what if it doesn't work? And I'm coming to say, it may not the first time. But tell somebody, keep coming. Keep, keep, keep coming. Because the call has complications. Didn't I say that? And with those complications, you have to remain committed. The call comes with complications. And with those complications, you have to remain committed. Raise your hand. Anybody ready to make a new commitment? It's the same water that he stumbled on the first time that he walked on the second time. What if God is calling you to go back to the same marriage with a new commitment? What if God is calling you to go back to the same job with a new commitment. You're going to leave this service and you're going back to the same house. What if you went through the door with a new commitment? Father, we thank you this morning. These are your daughters. These are your people. Even online, hands are lifted online. God, somebody is ready to do a new thing. God, you said, behold, I'll do a new thing. But God, you can't do a new thing if we are committed to remaining in an old place. And so God, I'm just praying for courage this morning. Courage to walk out the new commitment. It's not a new calling. It's not a new assignment. It's the same assignment with a new commitment. And so Father, strengthen somebody's resolve right now to go back different than when they came. God, we bind fear right now, and we lose courage. God, we bind timidity right now, and we lose freedom. God, we bind that desire to know all the answers before we leap and before we launch, because you never told us that the circumstances of our walking were going to be perfect, but you told us that we serve a perfect God. So no matter what happens while we're out there, there's a storm out on the ocean. And it may be moving our way, but God, because our souls are anchored in Jesus. God, we trust you this morning. Though the wind and the waves may blow, breathe through your Ruach and your Holy Spirit. Breathe on somebody's mind to release them, God, to be the woman you've called and destined them to be. And God, when we come back to this place this time next year, God, we can't wait to bring a brand new testimony about how you sustained us and how you carried us and how you held us in the midnight hour. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Nobody move, nobody get hurt. I want to do this and I'm going to sit down. I'm tired. In uh, the field of construction, Whenever there's a beam and they're erecting and they're building and they're constructing, when there's a beam that's not quite perpendicular, it's not quite square, when it's leaning, what they do is they bring something on this side and they bring something on this side, another block on this side, so that it can stand up straight I need every sister elbow to elbow elbow to elbow no sister untouched 
Do you know what that process is called when they bring something on this side to straighten it up and something on this side to straighten it up? You know what that's called? In construction, it's called sistering. Would you just look at your sister and say, you, you got help. You got, you, you, you got help. You, you ain't got to go through this by yourself. You, tell somebody, I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll encourage you. I'll, I'll walk with you. I, I won't be so busy that I can't look in your eyes because how many know sad eyes recognize sad eyes? And I, I won't be so busy that I can't see that you're going through, but, but I'll pray for you and you pray for me. And watch, watch God change things. You be blessed in the Lord, amen. Just hug somebody, hug a sister and say, burn the boat, burn, burn it down. Burn the boat, break the box, jump the rope. Her three women and tell her, burn the boat, break the box, and jump the rope. My God.